Hi, everyone, and welcome to SEDS Cast. It's your host, Owen Marr. Joining me today as co host is Rupal Nigam, and our guest today is Daniel Faber, who is the CEO of OrbitFab. Daniel, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, we're excited. Uh, I th- I'm trying to, I don't even actually remember how I first saw your company, but once I heard of the idea, I was like, all right, we got to talk to this guy and figure out what's going on. So mm-hmm. I guess the first question is could you give us an elevator pitch for OrbitFab and what you guys are doing? Yeah, we're building gas stations in space. We uh, we want to secure and enrich humanity's future. To do that, we need to get people into space and we need a bustling in space economy. That is not possible because there isn't the infrastructure. Most specifically, there's not enough fuel to bring spacecraft together, to interact, to have a bustling space economy. So that's what we're trying to fix. We're building the propellant supply chain, the whole material supply chain in Earth orbit starts with developing uh, and delivering fuel. Eventually, we want to be doing petrochemicals processing, toll refining asteroid material, and building the whole resource supply chain uh, that we need for that economy. Sweet. I'm really looking forward to discussing all that. Before we get there, we should probably back up a little bit and give context. Let's kind of start with what first got you interested in space, and did that influence you going into college, or was that something you discovered later in life? Oh, I read a lot of science fiction. I think I blame my parents for that, I guess. But uh, no, I got to university and didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was... uh, doing an engineering degree, mechanical engineering, um, but decided I, I wanted to, to do something that was useful and impactful for the world. Um, and because I can integrate, I decided that existential risks were the only really the thing working, worth working on. Um, so I, uh, I realized getting people off this rock will address a whole bunch of existential risks and probably be a really interesting career. Uh, and so far, so good on the interesting career. Getting off this rock, that's going to take more time. Definitely. What were, uh, so you said you went to school, it's for mechanical engineering, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. And what did you do when you came out of college? What was your first job, like full-time? I was lucky. I was on a scholarship program um, where I worked for four different companies while I was in undergrad. So I did mm. construction, power stations, uh, printing of biscuit wrappers, uh, you know, a bunch of interesting jobs. Um when I came out, I had a job lined up in the UK to build spacecraft, which was really cool uh, because I'd, I'd started a, a satellite project, um, an amateur satellite project at the university as undergrad and, and talked my way into, into that job. Unfortunately, they fired me a week before I started. Um, the, the satellite was supposed to be built in the UK and Astrium, now uh, um, Airbus, they uh, they declared they were going to, to build it in France and I don't speak French, so they didn't have a job for me. So they literally mm-hmm. called up and said, have you spent any money yet? No, excellent, don't, great, you don't have a job. Um, so I ended up going back and working on the power station things for a while. And then I worked for uh, Australian Defense Technology Organization. Uh, and then finally rambled my way into a job building spacecraft in Canada, uh, building, this is before CubeSat. So we were building microsats and, uh, and nanosats, uh, which was a, a fantastic place to be. Awesome. And what, uh, what experiences did you gain from those early positions? Like what were some of the key things you learned early on that translated into later jobs? Well, I'd realized being in Australia, there was no space agency and there's no big aerospace company. So while I had this this sort of big goal and ambition, I realized very quickly that the only way I was ever going to see any of that happen was if I did it myself. So I'd realized even in like first, second year undergrad that I was going to end up setting up companies. And I had an eye to that um, basically the whole the whole way through. So I got to Canada and whilst I had a great job and we're building some of the most cutting edge microsats and I was surrounded by amazing people, just completely lucked out on that. Um, and you know, sometimes lucky, uh, better to be lucky than smart. So <laughs> so I went on that. But um, but at the same time, I was looking at, uh, at side projects and, and working with a guy who had a, uh, a four inch 30 foot cannon in his backyard and wanted to, to build up to launching satellites to space. And, uh, and I was working on a bunch of other projects. And so I set up a company and started tinkering around with those things. And, and that sort of eventually led to, to my first startup company. So I learned a huge amount technically. Um, I was ready to quit fantastic jobs because I thought I could learn more going back to university or, you know, and then I ended up not going back and doing a master's because I got offered a job where I could learn even more. Um, so that I, I wasn't afraid to do that. Um, just, just making sure that I was always looking for opportunities and always taking them when I, when I saw great opportunities come along. So yeah, learned a lot technically and then learned a lot on the business side just by trying it and doing it. And, you know, I'll be honest, falling on my face a whole bunch of times, but always learning. Yeah. I think that's what matters. Even if you fail is that you learn something. So that's good to hear. 
uh, one of the companies that we're a big fan of on the podcast is Deep Space Industries. And we've had like a surprising amount of former executives. I don't even remember who's, I think this is like the third time we've talked to someone that's worked at Deep Space. You were there for a while. Can you talk a little bit about what brought you there and what your main focus was? Gosh, what brought me there? Um, I was living and working in the Netherlands on on CubeSats when uh, Planetary Resources announced. Uh, and of course, uh, having decided we should get off this rock you know, when I was in first year undergrad, I wrote down a list of industries that I thought could pay for the first permanent job off Earth. And mm-hmm. uh, and that list was tourism and mining. Um, that, that was it. And I decided I wasn't a tour operator, so I was going to work on mining. And so b- learning how to how to build satellites and technology, that was part of it. And, you know, I was lucky enough to build a dozen satellites or so, uh, and then started building companies. Uh, and so when Planetary Resources announced, of course, immediately I'm like, all right, I got to apply. Okay, I'm not an American. This isn't going to work very well. But in, anyway, working in the Netherlands on CubeSats, which had, had come to be after I started my career, and I wanted to find out what in the world this buzz was about, went to a small conference in the Isle of Man, just because I'd never been to the Isle of Man. And Rick Tomlinson was there, who you've probably had on this podcast. Um, and he was keynoting this uh, this event. And we got chatting at the bar uh, afterwards. And I was talking about CubeSats and small satellites and how I do really cheap prospecting missions to asteroids. And he wrote a, a non-disclosure agreement on a napkin and slid it across the bar. I signed the napkin. And then he read me in on Deep Space Industries. A week later, I was the, uh, the chief spacecraft designer. And... Uh, um, we we formed the company a couple of weeks uh, or a couple of months after that. So I was named as one of the co-founders, but it took a bunch of time to do the paperwork and, and get a bit of money in. Um, so it was 18 months later that I finally got to the US with the right paperwork and was able to, to get going. Uh, a couple of months after that, um, I took over as CEO and uh, and brought in a, a technology strategy. We, uh, we started building thrusters that could one day run off propellant that you could pull out of an asteroid because... Whilst we realized that propellant was the first thing that you could sell as a space resource was propellant in space, there was actually no thrusters that could use that propellant. So we had to start from scratch and build this whole ecosystem up. You'll appreciate now, of course, Orbit Fab is just step two. There are there are several thrusters that run off water or peroxide or hydrocarbons, things that you can make from an asteroid, but there's not yet a market in space for that propellant. And that's what we're building. So one day I'd, I'd love to place a patient purchase order with an asteroid mining company and uh, and toll refine their material and put it into an existing supply chain uh, it'll take a few years and there are several more steps and thankfully several large companies that uh that we're going to build before we we're done with that that was a fantastic story it's crazy how much power a napkin has i thought that was really <laughs> funny <laughs> um so once you have this like grand like futuristic goal for a company what's next like what sort of steps do you take after that to accomplish those goals figure out what you need to do today um, it's, it's easy to have a big goal and it's easy to have something to, to, to work on right now. It's actually very hard to link the two together and know why you're working on something right now and whether it's the right thing. But you need to do that because if you don't have a goal, if you don't have you know, a vision of the future that you want to create, then how do you know that the, the thing, like, how do you know you're going in the right direction? You'll build completely the wrong thing. And in systems engineering, right, you need to build the right thing and you need to build it right. So you have to be good at understanding what is the right thing to build. And then also you have to be really good at knowing how to execute so that the thing that you build today will work so that tomorrow you can build the thing you need to build tomorrow. So the day after that, you can build that thing. And so that you can achieve the big goals that you have. And uh, and that's that takes a lot of practice to and talking with people and learning from people and seeing how it's done to figure out what is an effective strategy and what is a good thing to work on today to to get to where you want to go. Awesome. So I think, you know, since we've talked about DSI a little bit, that does very nicely lead into OrbitFab. And we've talked about some high level stuff. And, you know, hopefully people that are listening should go check out the, what is the website? Is it orbitfab.space? Orbitfab.space. We also have orbitfab.com, either one. Got them both. I feel like if you have the dot space, that's like the signature of a space startup. And then once you got the dot com, maybe you're going somewhere. I don't know. But um, so let, let's talk about some of the details. One of my first questions was, you know, is it a gas station or is it a gas delivery service? Is Are you in an orbit where people come to you or are you delivering to satellites? Yeah, really good question. So I thought about this a lot when we got started and um, mm-hmm. I'm I came at this from having I realized we were selling 
water thrusters at deep space industries, basically superheated steam kettles that could move satellites around. Um, the propulsion like capability, the ISP or the, the fuel efficiency, is not too bad. Like it's about the same as a solid rocket motor, 180 seconds ISP, but it's not that great either. There's a lot of better things out there. I mean, electric thrusters are about 2000 seconds ISP. So it was quite a trade-off for our customers. They had to carry more fuel if they brought out cheap thruster as opposed to buying an expensive thruster and carrying less fuel. So your know, Orbit Fab was, in, was the natural response to that. Let's, let's solve the problem in a different way. And we talked to customers uh, and realized there were, there were the companies that were looking to do satellite servicing. So repairing spacecraft, maybe refueling them, inspecting them, uh, garbage collection, deorbiting dead satellites, a whole bunch of things that you could class catalog under satellite servicing was effectively tow trucks in space. And so... Um, we saw those companies, there are eight or nine of them, and said, hey, they're going to need fuel. And we found that their business model was to, to build a shiny new tow truck, launch it into space, tow three spacecraft, run out of fuel, and throw away the tow truck and build another one. I mean, you can't imagine doing that on Earth, right? We'd have just piles of dead tow trucks lying around. So, so that's, uh, that's where we said, all right, let's, how about we sell fuel to them? And of course, it was a no-brainer, right? Like, how about you service 10 or 100 customers with your one asset? Um, and so that was that was sort of where it, it, it sort of really took off from uh, from in that respect. And so, yeah, that's that's that was double down, do the do the fuel supply, build it up from that and then uh, move on to some of the bigger things that uh, that we want to do on the back of having that logistics. Sure. I'm going to pay you what I think is the biggest compliment I can give. And that's you kind of sound like Elon, but for satellites, because uh, I think, <laughs> you know, he made the same argument about rockets. And the reusability. So when when you say that, you know, there's definitely something there. Um, Rupa, I liked your question about the propellant stuff. Yeah, could you tell us a little more about the fuels? Like, are there different types of fuels for different types of spacecrafts, or are you just focusing on one right now? Well, we looked at what people were buying, uh, and while I'd like to just you know go straight to the end game and sell the water and hydrocarbons that we could get out of the moon uh, and, and asteroids and turn those into useful things. People aren't buying that right now. What they're buying is hydrazine and xenon. And you can't actually make either of those from the asteroids and the moon because there's there's no noble gases there. Those have been blown out to the outer solar system if they're not stuck at the bottom of a really strong gravity well like Earth. Um, same with nitrogen. Like it, it bonds into N2 and disappears unless you have a strong gravity well and you need nitrogen to make hydrazine. But that's what people want to buy. So we've got to start there selling people what they want to buy and we're going to build a big business on the on the back of that. And then we can show them the advantages of some of these alternative fuels and start to shift the market. So that's those are the fuels that we're selling. Um, I realized I didn't answer your question before, Owen. Um, when we put the tankers up, we launched them. They're meant to be very low cost. Our goal is reduce the cost of the tankers, right? Reduce the cost of this whole propellant supply by hook or by crook, get fuel up there cheaper. Launch it in bulk, like launch a bottle of tequila and sell it by the shot, um, you know, all, all that kind of thing. What, what that means is we'd prefer not to do the rendezvous docking. But then there are these satellite servicing companies that are doing that kind of thing anyway. So we sell to them and they go and deal with all the legacy satellites because they've got all the robotics and everything and they're, they're paying and they're focused on winning that market. There are now 45 satellite servicing companies. So it's like a 500% increase in three years. It's a, a staggering increase, which is a good indication that there's value to be created, right? There's, all the investors are piling money in because they think there's value creation here. From, uh, from satellite servicing. We just want to sell picks and shovels to, to those guys that are in a gold rush. How many other companies are interested in doing what you're doing, sort of the, the getting the propellant up to space? We've seen a bunch of companies working on cryogenic propellants, um, which is great for rockets, right? liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, liquid methane. Uh, great for rockets, but boils off, right? You've got to keep it at very cold temperatures, and that requires a lot more equipment. So when I looked at that and, uh, and my co-founder, we... We couldn't find a minimum viable product. And when you want to start a startup company, you really want an MVP, something that you can bootstrap very cheaply and, and has marginal value to the customer, but you can, you can go and get a little bit of business and a little bit of expertise and build it up. With cryogenics, you need hundreds of millions of dollars. Right? We need single digit millions. There's a huge difference. So that's why we decided storable propellants for satellites that are already in orbit is the, the best place to start. Now, if you've got access to infinite capital like Elon Musk or, or NASA, um, they've, uh, NASA, NASA just put a few hundred million dollars into uh, advancing the technology for cryogenic fuel depots. 
and uh, and SpaceX wants to to refuel their own um, Starship, but um, that again works really well for for refueling the upper stages of rockets. Doesn't necessarily work so well for for satellites in orbit. So at the moment, no one else has announced that they're doing storable propellants. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if there there aren't other companies that are also working on it. But our goal is just make all the bits that are needed, get our customers access to it, worry about our customers and solving the problems rather than our competitors. Mm. Are these so, satellites you're looking to refuel like in Leo or Geo? We're looking at both. Um, there are big, expensive assets in Geo, so they benefit a lot from uh, from having fuel. Um, you know, occasionally they get stranded in the wrong orbits and don't have enough fuel to get to their orbit, and you can lose a satellite then that was supposed to bring in you know, several billions of dollars of, of revenue over its lifetime, and they're just gone at that point if you can't get them to there. So there's a there's a lot of waste that happens because there's no fuel in Geo, but in Leo. There's now so many satellites going up to Leo. We've got to worry about those that, that die. And about one percent of satellites just go just go dark every year, right? That's the typical failure rate. Which means that if you launch ten thousand satellites every single year, you've got a hundred satellites that have gone dark, and they're now cluttering up your operational orbit. So we need garbage collection. We also think that they're going to benefit from having the option of refueling just in case the next technology refresh is a bit delayed. There's a whole bunch of reasons why. Um, having having fuel in in low Earth orbit is going to be useful. And as soon as you start to look at larger things, um, there are a couple of companies that want to do in space manufacturing. Um, of course, there's Axion and, and Nanorax are talking about uh, commercial space stations. They're going to need consumables: fuel, air, water, lubricants, three D print, printer feedstock. I mean, that's all the stuff that we want to provide. So we expect that that low Earth orbit will be you know, just as interesting a market as Geo. So. You mentioned earlier that you were working on CubeSats before they were CubeSats, right? And I'm guessing those were pretty, um, I think Yuan used the term Fabergé egg for the Model X on the podcast yesterday. Um, but like they're, they were very one-offs. Um, and so with the rise of CubeSats and sort of the standardization, I'm wondering how much of your spacecraft have to be specifically designed for what you want to do versus just parts you're sourcing. Because I imagine... It's probably not easy to buy propellant transfer parts, but it might be easier to buy some other CubeSat materials. How much of it do you have to like? Does how much of it do you have to like source versus how much are you designing and building yourself? Yeah, you'll appreciate as a as a systems engineer, you take the problem and you break it down, and then each of those subsystems, you look at then you you make a, a make versus buy decision, uh, and then at the at the higher level, you can have a make versus buy decision at the integration level. There are a lot of satellite integrators out there. Um, you know, arguably, there's an oversupply of, of people who want to bolt satellites together. So why would we do that if there's lots of people who know how to do it? And then you know, let them worry about the subsystems. Um, similarly, when we look at subsystems, pretty much everything is is good to go. The things that, that weren't ready were the fueling ports, which we had to develop. There was no commercially available fueling port for satellite that could be used in space. So we brought one to market. That was the first thing we did. Uh, there's also no uh, interface specification for cooperative docking. And while all of the, um, the the tow trucks companies, the satellite servicing companies, are working on non-cooperative docking, or, or um, yeah, uncooperative, non-cooperative, they um, they're you know, they're solving a harder problem, and it adds complexity. They might need radar and lidar and various things. Um, whereas if you have a full cooperative docking, you can have inter-satellite communications and rely on the other system having like a GPS and transmitting to you its position and all these types of things. You can see how that would let you build a lower cost system when it's cooperative. And so mm -hmm. what's the specification for that didn't exist. So we've said, all right, we're going to write a specification. We're going to do all the modeling and analysis and orbit planning and everything else. And then once we've written a specification, so we know, you know, we can publish this and say, if you can do this, you can come and dock with our tanker. We might as well also build the kit. So we're taking mm -hmm. existing components, algorithms, whatever, just put them in a box and, and sell the box. Uh, and, you know, because it just helps build our ecosystem, we'll sell them for cost. Like we'll sell them dirt cheap, the, the fuel import mm -hmm. and that that's that's not our business. Our business is selling fuel. Uh, so we want to see all that uh, all that happen. But those are sort of the, the key technology bits. And then on our side, it's, um, you know, feed systems. How do you pump fuel? Um, pumping xenon, which is a supercritical fluid, is absolutely hideous. Uh, I, I challenge anyone who wants to, to break their brains in uh, undergrad thermo to challenge their teachers to figure out how to pump xenon. Um, yeah, it's uh, that's kind of fun, uh, but then of course later on we want to get into the whole propellant production. So we're looking at fuel factories in space. Like, what does a refinery look like? 
how do we separate things? If we're pulling from asteroids, uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, how do you turn that into all of the useful things that we might want? And, uh, and so we want to start tackling those things as well pretty soon. Yeah. I think what you're talking about with making your, uh, basically creating your own standardization for the ports is a great idea. That's, uh, that was going to be my follow-up question was like, is there a way to make a standard port and get it recognized? But I guess if you're just able to sell them at cost, it reminds me a lot of like what's going on with different electric charging stations right now and the supercharger network and the Electrify America Yep. And the uh, the non-standardization seems to be a big problem with that. And I would imagine it would be for space. So I think that's really cool. You're going to be able to offer that to people that are building satellites and are hoping to refuel them at some point. Yeah, um, you've got to realize a lot of this. There's there's no magic pixie dust for most things in, in space, right? You, mm-hmm. don't, you don't need to, uh, to redesign everything. And in fact, it's a big problem in the space industry is the hubris that we are smarter than everyone else and it's crap. The... Um, there's so much we can get from elsewhere. So I've been reading uh, The Box, uh, a great history of the standardization of the shipping container and, and how that came about. We still have decades. Like it's a hugely complex industry, transportation. How in the world did they agree on what the box should look like? But they did, and it changed the world. Um, yeah, so, so I looked at that and a whole bunch of things. And here in Silicon Valley, I, uh, a friend of a friend came up with the name Bluetooth. And that, you know, that became a standard. He was on the team that developed that. How, how did that happen? Right? There are people trying to figure out interface standards all the time. And so we don't have to just imagine and try and come up with things. We talk to people who did it and they tell us what they did and what didn't work and what sucked and what was easy. And then we can worry about the right things. Something I was curious about is if there's like existing satellites that you want to refuel, is there any way to do that? Or is it going to have to be through the standard port you were talking about? Yeah, NASA's got a mission called Restore L, um, where they're going to use robots to tap into the fill drain ports that they use to fill them on the ground. Now, those ports have been locked shut. They've got tie wires, like lock wires, so that the nuts don't come off. Then they put a cap on top of that, and then they put thermal insulation on top of that. So there's a whole bunch of things they have to do to get in there, like it's robotic surgery in space, um, which drives cost and everything, but a fantastic capability. So they're able to do it. I think Northrop Grumman's solution is a lot better. And Astroscale uh, are, um, uh, are doing a similar thing soon, which is to attach a life extension vehicle, like a jetpack, to the side of an operating satellite that runs out of fuel and just take over the thrusting function and control the spacecraft. So that, to me, seems a little uh, less complicated because there's less robotics. But once the robotics is tried and tested and you know we have AI getting on board for all of that, um, Maybe that's the right solution. It's hard to say. What we want, of course, is let's try all these approaches and let's see what wins in the market, right? Who can beat? On, who can win on price? Who can win on capability? What do the customers actually want? All those things have to be figured out by the, the dirty process of trial and error. That's, that's what uh, running a business is. Yeah, I remember okay, so hearing about that Northrop one. I think it's the mission extension vehicle has also been yeah. a concept. Yep. Um, I guess going back to OrbitFab, what progress have you made so far? Wow. Um, let's see. We formed the company in 2018. Uh, we got funded in June of that year. Uh, at the same time, also the International Space Station National Lab, uh, they organized like science experiments and commercialization on the space station. They said that they'd let us like fly a tanker and give us some astronaut time inside the space station. So we put two test beds on the International Space Station. We built that hardware in four and a half months. Um, it, it contains about three, three gallons of water inside this test bed, and we pumped it between the two tanks. It turns out if you've got more than a gallon of water, they, they class it a, a, as a catastrophic level hazard because if the water gets out and gets on the face of an astronaut, they can't wipe it away. So the astronaut can, like, they can't yell for help. They try and wipe it away. It's surface tension is the strongest force. It just curls straight back over you. And so it's a, it's a, it's a like, don't let that happen, right? So you've got to, got to make sure it's absolutely safe. Uh, so they threw the book at us and told us it would be 18 to 24 months to, to build this thing. We did it in four and a half. We went through all their programs. We got them all on board. It was there, There's some war stories in that, but we, we made it work. Uh, so that was a good start. Uh, then during that process, we realized there's no standard fueling port. Right? There's no commercially available fueling port at all. Um, so we started building that. Uh, now we've, uh, we've got that done. Uh, we actually, National Science Foundation supported us on the, the rendezvous and docking interface that I mentioned. So we've got the, uh, the basics of that down, Pat. So we've been able to sign up now for our, our first operational tanker launch, which is this, this thing you can see behind me if you can see the video. 
Uh, our first operational tanker, we called it Tenzing One because it's riding on a spaceflight Sherpa vehicle. Um, it's going to be uh, launched mid this year, and uh, and it'll be the world's first operational fuel tanker. Uh, beyond that, it's all about scaling up and uh, doing end-to-end -end demos of refueling with uh, with potential satellite servicing customers. What sort of satellite size are you expecting for your initial fleet, like both in terms of the up mass and like how much propellant they'll house roughly? I don't know if you can say. Yeah, our MVP, our minimum viable product, is a, uh, a microsat. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's got 20, 30 kilograms of propellant in it. That's barely enough for, uh, for some customers, um, but it is enough that we can do some missions with that. Uh, ideally, we want to scale it up to, to hundreds of kilos and then to uh, the sort of one ton range. Um, and then we're just going to follow demand, right? We'll, we'll see what people ask for and we'll follow that. Awesome. Um, what does the time like, or timeline look like moving into the future? So let's say you're able to you know, get this MVP up in the, the next year and like do some sort of tech demo. Are you, like, are you hoping to get another infusion of cash from venture capital and then produce this fleet or what is what are the stepping stones that get you to having like a, a large fleet in orbit servicing multiple satellites yeah our initial funding round was actually led by a vc firm an early stage vc firm which was great um they were good support um and then our, our most recent round uh, had a lot of uh, investors who who make early stage investments in the space industry so uh names that are known around the space financing community which is is good to have them on board and supporting us uh we also have Munich Re Ventures. Now, Munich Re is a, one of the world's largest insurance companies. In fact, they're the world's largest mm. satellite insurance company. And they have a VC arm to look at strategic deals. And they want to be sort of at the front uh, of the queue when risks are shifting and there's new insurance policies, like new things to be created. So they see satellite servicing as completely changing how the space industry might work and how their insurance products need to evolve. And so uh, they're on board. We see that as a, you know, we need insurance and we also need like a financial understanding and, and how to do our contracts and everything else. So that's an excellent relationship we build up there. Uh, going forward, yeah, we're looking for another VC-led round uh, shortly. Um, so that's that's going to be important for us. That'll let us then execute the full uh, demonstration missions with customers and, uh, and start building up inventory in orbit. Uh, we're also expecting that we'll sign the first contracts soon for, for sale of fuel. Uh, and so we'll need to be, um, you know, making sure those are, are executed well, uh, and we build up that customer base. And in terms of timeline, um, the MVP, the, the first fuel tank is going up middle of this year, end-to-end uh, -end fuel sale demonstration expected 2022. Uh, and then it's just a, just a matter of ramping up. Um, I'd love to talk about some of the fuel factory and space work that we're doing uh, and how we've kicked those projects off, but uh, not a lot of that's public yet. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. And we like to speculate about the future of space, so we can probably jump to that. Um, what do you see, you know, if you're looking, let's start with like 20 years down the road, what do you expect the infrastructure to be like? Do you think we'll need this same sort of system around the moon or around Mars? Um, and also you talked about asteroid mining and kind of processing those materials. What are your, What is your dream there or your vision there? Yeah, I and mean, I expect we'll have a, a bustling economy in space, and I want to see a million people living in orbit. Right? I, I'm I'm not in the in the camp of living on the moon or, or or Mars. I think once we get out of a gravity well, the most stupid thing we can do is go back. Uh, so, so I'm all about free flying habitats, pulling asteroids apart using that material, and and I expect that. I I told you my my list of ways to pay for the first permanent jobs in space was tourism and mining. Uh, honestly, I think mining is probably going to be done by robots, for better or for worse. Uh, but tourism's tracking pretty well now that we have manned launch again, uh, and the Russians no longer have a monopoly that, that only the U.S. government could afford. Um, so there's there's more manned launch or, or crewed launch happening. Um, that's going to lead to tourism, but also you know, Tom Cruise wants to shoot a movie in space. We're going to start to see entertainment content creation, which is, is very cool. Um, we're going to start to see in-space manufacturing. That wasn't on my initial list, but now we have Varda Space and Space Forge, and there's a couple of other companies looking at that, uh, made in space, um, making products for use on the ground as well as making products for use in space. And so as we see more exports from space to the ground where, where there's more customers, that if you can think of it as an, an export economy, creating an internal economy. And what typically happens is that sort of one export job will support 10 to 100 internal economy jobs. 
but we need to get to the first job in space. And once we've crossed that threshold and now we want to keep someone alive and happy in space, we'll have the first space farmer, right? We're going to want leafy greens because, frankly, the food is a little rough. And we're going to want somebody who designs a better toilet. And once you've been in space and you know how things move in zero-g, let's face it, you'll be able to design toilets much better. It'll be one of the first things they solve when somebody realizes, hey, I'm not going home. Like This is home. I better fix that. And we're going to come up with really interesting things. And so we'll have entertainment spaces and people will start living there and then we'll need medical facilities and then we'll need schools and then we'll need hospitals. Or then we need, you name it, it's, it's, we're going to move every single industry we have on earth into space. And that's exciting, right? Now, you know, a million people living in space, uh, of which a few thousand are working on, on high value exports to earth and the rest are all keeping each other happy, entertained, uh, growing, expanding, it's, that's that's the future that I expect to see. That's in free space, and we'll feed it with resources from the best place that we can get it, the the cheapest place we can get it. And, and Orbit Fab's job is to to keep the materials coming from the Earth, from the asteroids, whatever. We'll be we'll be there. Air, water, propellant, lubricants, dirt. Like what, what do you need? That's our job. Sounds good enough to me. Uh, Rupal, do you have anything else you want to go over as far as Orbit Fab? Um, no, those were my main questions, so we can go on to advice. Yeah, sure. I guess before we jump to advice, other than going to your website, are there other ways people can, you know, either follow you on socials, follow OrbitFab on socials? How can people learn more about the company? Yeah, please do. We're on most of the socials, I think. Uh, I'm most active on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find me there and, and connect with me. Um, yeah, I try. we try and keep the, uh, the company updates flowing through, uh, through LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, typically. Um, awesome. Please look us up. Sweet. Yeah, Rupal, uh, do you want to kick off advice? Well, I mentioned on, uh, on our website, uh, we often have job openings coming up. We are likely to have a few more uh, middle of this year. So please keep an eye on our website for those two. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, so what advice do you have for our listeners and maybe specifically students who are interested in entrepreneurship and in space? The best advice that I could give is start doing things. I mentioned that you should have a big goal and, and you should link that back to what you're working on today. Don't let that stop you working on something today. Sometimes that, that goal will form over time, right? You'll figure it out, you'll figure out a path. So keep thinking about that, but get involved in things, right? SEDS, great organization. Start organizing conferences and meeting people and networking and, and what have you. And if you like doing projects, start doing projects. These days, you can build a satellite. Um, that's amazing. Right? You can you can build rockets. You can you can start building these things, and then yeah, read the papers, find the interesting tech, follow the rabbit holes that uh, that that entertain you, especially when you can line them up with the big term, long term goals, and then put your own strategy together. And so that strategy should be build skills, build capability, build network, build experience, and then use that as soon as you possibly can to, to go in the direction you want to go and just keep going. So this will kind of go with Rupal's question. I'll try and phrase it a little bit differently, but it's, it's always the last one we ask. And that's just your general advice to young people um, who are interested in space or not interested in space. Just things you wish you had known when you were our age. Things I wish I'd known. Gosh, I, I sometimes hear people say, if I had my life over, I'd do it all the same. Um, I don't say that because I've learned things. <laughs> um, don't be afraid to make mistakes it, it is the best way to learn things um, it might be embarrassing uh, I've done my fair share of that get up and do it again well, not the same thing of course but <laughs> go and do the next thing and just take the lessons with you don't be afraid uh, to, to make mistakes what you want to do is figure out how to make mistakes that are recoverable and then if a mistake is recoverable if the cost of failure is nothing and you know, let's Face it, being embarrassed is nothing, right? Just go out and, and make as many mistakes as you can to learn. I mean, don't make them for the sake of making them, but don't be afraid of something going wrong. Um, yeah, the, definitely. I and mean, here in Silicon Valley, it's it's VCs almost won't back you unless you've failed once or twice on somebody else's dollar. So uh, so they they see that as a as a point of learning, and I think that's that's really important. One of the things that we have now with CubeSats and building spacecraft like that is that you can also fail with space hardware, 
right? You can push the boundaries and you don't have to make sure that 100% this thing has to succeed because your reputation and your career and maybe 20 years of work went into this and, and billions of dollars. We can now do it a lot quicker and we can take a few risks and that's okay. But take smart risks, right? Take managed risks, but don't be afraid of the risks. Just be managing them. There you go. That's, that's my advice. One of the really cool things, like right, th this infrastructure that we're trying to build, and we're not the only ones, like CubeSats exists now as a, as a format to get things to Earth. We'll have propellant on orbit. Uh, we might have 3D printers, all these kind of things. These are infrastructure that you can take new ideas that haven't existed and build them. And you're, you're all at university, right? You get to learn about this stuff and start your careers with it all existing, which is a damn sight better than where I was 20 years ago. So make the most of that. I'm kind of jealous. You get to build this, this in-space economy. You get to go up there with the first people that are going to live in space. Um, yeah, find out what you want to do and go for it. There's so many opportunities, so many things to build, new businesses, new technologies. Yeah, amazing time. I like that a lot. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Anything we missed? Orbit Fab, early career advice, general shout out you want to give to young people? Anything else you want to go over? Oh, join SEDS to make the most of it. It's a, it's a great organization. It's global. Um, coronavirus will be over soon. God, we hope. And uh, yeah, there's there's great conferences and events. Get involved. That's the really the most important thing. Awesome. All right. On behalf of Rupal, thank you, Daniel, for joining us today. I hope everyone had a great time listening. This was super fun to talk about. So thanks, everyone. And we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.